Hello. We are here today to talk about yoga history, which is an ever-evolving subject. As yoga has come to the West, we've discovered it in the physical asana, usually first. That's how people become exposed to it. And then we kind of work our way back into the mental realm, into the spiritual practices, depending on your level of interest. And through backtracking through those lineages is where we're starting to find missing parts, missing texts, reference material, and basically a, another evolution of the history of yoga. So we actually start to put together the context, the philosophies that came with the practices, the worldview that came with these liberating practices, and really when we can put them all together, it forms more of a whole uh, that really makes more sense for a lot of us, depending, of course, on your level of interest and devotion to the yogic path. So, we'll start by just looking at a couple time periods. We have the pre-Vedic period, we have the Vedic period, we have pre-classical, classical, and post-classical, we have modern. So, I have a little PowerPoint that will help us kind of guide along those time periods and then we'll start to also look at the texts that come within those time periods and that helps us get a, a timeline and I'll show you a timeline of yoga history and how much of yoga history is in reference to which aspects of yoga I bet you can guess so let me just screen share here start with yoga history uncovering the missing links so this is a very exciting aspect of yoga to me because it's really endless how far back in time we can go and what texts have tra traveled across time and space to bring us the wisdom of devout practitioners we'll look at those so first we have the pre-vedic period so this is a number of signs of yoga were seen in the Indus Saraswati River Valley civilization uh, around 33 or thir to 1300 BCE in northern India. So this is one reference. There's uh, the reference of satellite imagery uh, into the Saraswati River Valley. So this imagery gives us a geologic time frame of how old that riverbed is, the Saraswati River Valley, about 10,000 years old. And this river valley was mentioned and spoken about, sung about, in the Vedas. So, could be up to 10,000 years old. And you talk to any given yogi and they will give you all kinds of different time frames. So, hard to know exactly how old yoga is. Alright, but it is the union, so it's probably the oldest concept that exists. All right. So the Vedic period, this is anywhere from 1700 BCE to 500 before current era. So this is a very long time period and in the later part of this time period starting about 4000 or sorry, yeah, somewhere between oh there it is. Um between 2000 and 1500 BCE which is, yeah, about 1700. That is not only the Vedic period, but when the Vedas were sung and carried along through lineage ver vocally, verbally, and then written down later, and thus you get the Vedas. So the Vedas were sung in things called hymns. The Vedas means knowledge or wisdom, eternal knowledge. This is what you can translate the word Veda to. And this is the first place we see the word yoga. So here is where we first see yoga. And uh, as I said, they were written in slokas or hymns and sung and then eventually written down by these people called rishis or seers. There's lots of different uh, perspectives on what these rishis were. Were they people? Were they practitioners? Were they shamans? Um, often there's this, also this um, ancient history of Indian shamanism that comes through in different 
lineages of Tantra, Yoga, Hinduism, things like that. So we can start to reach back even further. And then shamanism is hardly ever written down um, until the modern day. And so the Rishis could have been shamans. I've also heard that they were non-binary um, and they were non-human. All kinds of things. I don't know what they would be if they weren't human. Uh, yeah, so total mystery pretty much. Where the Vedas came from, who wrote them. Uh, but it was a very long period and it was a collection of these Hindu concepts. Not only Hindu, but um, these concepts that came from listening to the universe. It's as though the song of the universe was already there, has always been there, and the Vedas were the ones they pulled out. So the Rishis listened, they pulled out these hymns from pre-existing sound and then wrote them down. So it's like the mysteries of the universe came to them. And this is one of the ways it's described. All right. So in this Vedic period, the aim of Vedic yoga shared by the Rishis and the Yogis was sacrifice. Uh, so this is individual's body and soul to unite with the Supreme. So it was a practice of tapas, discipline, uh, asana as in postures, samadhi as a sort of surrender. So this is the aim of Vedic yoga. It was to denounce the body, let it go, and reach towards the divine by denying the rest of reality. Okay. So here's another just summary of what was happening. These are some old postures, very old postures done by these previous yogis. And we'll start to, we'll have a whole, there's a whole nother section where we can start to look at where the postures actually came from. But there's no postures mentioned in the Vedas specifically. Nothing like an asana. All right. Then we have our pre-classical period. So this is the epoch period. Upasan, up. Upna Sadik, <laughs> so the Upanishads, um, another text. Uh, so the text of the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, are written in the pre classical period. Classical period is where you get Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, and we start to move forward with other texts. So pre classical, about 500 to 200, still before current era. So this is before Christ. And this is where the concepts um, emerge into other scriptures such as the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. As I said, the Upanishads are described as uh, to sit near. That's what the word Upanishad translates. So more of an experiential learning rather than the Vedic period, which was more of a follow the instructions of the Vedas. The Upanishads is experiential. Come, be with your guru, sit beside, and experience. The Bhagavad Gita is an epic tale describing the internal process of Arjuna and his dharma, his, his purpose in life, his duty, if you will. So this is also a pre-classical period. It's starting to describe yoga as a connector between mind and soul. And practice, restraint of breath. The Upanishads have all kinds of descriptions of different uh, different breath work, so pranayamas, but they still don't talk about physical posture much in the in the Upanishads. And Bhagavad Gita describes the different styles of yoga, the different ways that you can approach your yogic practice, uh, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, yana yoga. These are the ones described in the Bhagavad Gita. We'll get more into that. And then Buddhism is also coming around in this time frame. So Buddha, an avatar of sorts, um, came and had his teachings in a very specific Pali region of India. Classical period. This is the beginning of 
systematizing the methods of yoga. So there's been a lot of things going on prior to these years, to the current era. And when we get to Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, that's actually a culmination of many, many practices from before that were then organized and systematized into Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Now, we don't know who Patanjali is. Uh, he could have been a single man, a, a rishi, a, could have been a yogi, could have been a collection of people. We don't know. Uh, but we do know, as we will get further in talking about the Yoga Sutras, that Patanjali is actually in reverence to the serpent when you break down the word. So then we're talking about a little kundalini, which also has a huge history. All right. So this is Raja Yoga, which comes later. It's a culmination of all those previous yoga styles into this one gets us back into meditation and the focus of controlling the mind through systematic practice and reaching samadhi, so a state of surrender. Post-classical period. So this main focus is to live in the current moment and accept reality rather than to strive to liberate a person from existence. So this is where we start to come to a point of acceptance for what is. And this is a very tantric concept. Here is also, we'll see the origins of tantric teachings. Not really the origins, actually. It's more of like more culmination and, and a rebirthing of tantric philosophies. And it's kind of like Tantra pulls from Patanjali Yoga Sutras. And it's very interesting how the philosophies and the worldview start to fade away as it moves forward. But here we have, in the post-classical period, we have the concentration on God and letting go of meditation and contemplations from that classical period and moving into this exploration of present moment, exploration of the body and acceptance for what is life. All right. And then we'll get into the modern time period. But let's take a moment to look at our timeline here. So as I said, the Vedic period is quite a long period. There's pre-Vedic, and that is probably more in the shamanistic realm. And this is where they were really noisy, probably. There was, you know, animal totems and very earthy. And then as we get into the Vedas, it, it becomes something austere, and, and we're looking towards priests or Brahmans to give instruction from these different Vedic books. So there's the Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yahur Veda, and Artharva Veda. And these are different knowledges of practice. And so as these were read by Brahmins, people would practice them specifically, or you would hire a Brahminical priest or, or you know, um, commission, you could say. I'm not sure what the word is, but get a priest to help you with your practice. And so this was, it kind of kept people a little bit separated from this spiritual approach. We move forward, we get to the Upanishads. So this is at the end of the Vedas, is the Upanishads. And here is, as I said, where we start to identify experiences within the individual and these become more of a common teaching more experiential to sit down near to experience with uh, so this is a big shift from the priest do it to Upanishad everybody is experiencing still hierarchy still the caste system is going on here in India all right and then just before the, uh, it, it depends on where you get your information as to when the Yoga Sutras came about. But here it's not mentioning the, oh there it is at the bottom, the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita comes about 
just before current era and crosses the threshold there into current era so it's right in that transition period and this is the epic age so this is where we're getting um, ideas beyond our limitations beyond the limitations of the mind and as I said the three three main aspects of yoga the three main uh, or original types of yoga jnana yoga jnana it's like a kind of a nasal sound is the study yoga of study and devotion um, karma yoga is the yoga of action service and then we have bhakti yoga which is ultimate devotion dancing singing total love and devotion to the divine they say that one's the easiest one <laughs> because you go through bliss all right this is in this uh, bhakti yoga is very much like when you read uh, rumi rumi is very much like like a bhakti yoga okay and then this is where we also find the hindu bible the mahabharata and this is a collection of epic poems describing the different Hindu gods and the development of the Hindu culture. All right. Then we have Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which here it, it says that it's coming a little earlier, but I've he I've seen it mostly coming around 200 current era is when we get Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And as I said, this ha is a culmination of all previous works of yoga and a system systemizing of it so that we get our eight limbs, our Ashtanga Yoga, not the Ashtanga Yoga of Patavi Joyce, but Ashtanga Yoga as in eight limbs. And here we have several books called Padas. And these Padas describe the aim of yoga in the first, the practice of yoga, the resulting powers of yoga, and ultimate liberation. So this is the Yoga Sudras, Sutra, Sutra, and we'll have classes on that. So this is known as Raja Yoga, the kingly path, or the path of meditation. All right, so we move forward from here, and we start to get into the Tantras. So the Tantras come about, um, here it's describing them a little bit late, but they start to come about from medieval India. Um, and this is a non-dual approach. So now we're acknowledging all of existence as sacred. And this is the emergence of Hatha Yoga and integration of things into the body. Um, still, there are no specific um, asanas that we know of in common text so far. Now, there is specific a, a tantric lineage that, ha that contains physical postures um, that are in relation to the Sanskrit alphabet, but we don't have that information translated yet. So somewhere in this time period of the Tantras is when we start to get physical practice. Uh, Tantra emerges from the religion of Shaivism. So this is seeing Shiva as the ultimate divine. And then it starts to uh, move not only from Shiva, but also Shakti. And then you get goddess worship. You get a couple different sects of Tantra describing uh, either two different paths. One that's a little more Brahm Brahminical and priestly, and one that becomes for the common people that is also transgressive and starts to shake up the foundation of normal Indian society at the time, especially the caste system and... Uh, common no-nos of culture. So they start expanding their spiritual base, their experiences past any social structures. And this is a very liberating and empowering practice as it continues to move and develop. And basically from this point forward, everything um, is infused with Tantra. So even in the word Tantra, it's uh, to go beyond. There's a couple different interpretations of the word and I'll teach a whole a whole nother class on Tantra specifically but it infuses these teachings Tantras are also books 
um, into the rest of yoga as we move forward. So from this point forward, if you're practicing yoga within the body, more than likely it has tantric lineage. Um, however, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras that we do learn today doesn't include any of that. But the practices that we're practicing in yoga do include a lot of that, a lot of the tantric concepts. So, yeah, we'll start to integrate it. All right. So, as I said, tantra, you know, is to expand, to go beyond. And as it expands, it expands and inflates into the rest of yoga. So that's a, you know, a culmination of tantric texts are coming about um, in about a thousand, the year a thousand, thousand CE. And we start getting different aspects of them. And then this, it, there's a, a shift in history where um, India is taken over by Muslims and then there's a lot of texts that go missing. And so then there's kind of this dissolving of Tantra and I think that's why we've lost a lot of that information as it moves forward because then there's this grassroots aspect of yoga that starts to come about about 1300s called the Hatha. So this is where yoga starts to come back into popularity. So we have the Hatha Yoga Pradipika which translates, I like this translation, the lowdown on how to go beyond all limitations poised, posed by living in a mundane reality where nature and spirit are kept separate. That's a pretty fun uh, translation on what Hatha Yoga Pradipika means. And this once again is a culmination of previous practices and then brought about in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika and made popular here they've left behind a lot of the philosophy and worldviews and now they're just going for some basic practices. And these practices include asana. So this is where we really see asanas come to light. They include asana, they include kriyas or cleansings, um, and pranayama, shatkarma is another cleansing style. Pranayama is our breath work. Bandhas, mudras, we'll get into what those are. Uh, and this basically is describing several sitting postures, various sitting postures. So one big aspect about this is that we we don't have any more mantra within the Hatha Yoga Pradipika specifically. And Tantra, the mantra is a really big aspect of Tantra. That's one of the qualifying factors for Tantras. So the Hatha Yoga Pradipika pulls a lot of the practices from Tantra and from Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, not separate. It's like the Yoga Sutras got swept into the Tantra movement and then we extracted out the practices without the worldview and philosophy. And so then we get Hatha Yoga Pradipika. This is where we get our asanas from. And this starts the Hatha lineages. Uh, even though they do kind of start a little bit before that, you have this uh, Garaksha Padati. Padati. Uh, so this is another Hatha Yoga text mentioning those 84 asanas. And then the Hatha Yoga Pradipika describes more lotus postures. So this is really where we see asanas come about. Garaksha. So this is another really cool reference book, a reference text for the physical practice that we're so enamored with these days. All right, and then we move forward into modern times. So this is modern is called, is referring to the growth of yoga outside of India. So everything else up to that is classical, post-classical, Click one more time. Here's a nice reference website. Oh, I think we have to go back. Here we go. So, after the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, 
we start to move into the modern age of yoga where yoga starts to come to the west so here we see the seeds planted the first exposure of yoga to the west is in 1983 with swami vivekananda he had a speech to the parliament of world religions um, calling us all brothers and sisters and uh, calling saying that we only have one religion and so this was very popular and that started kind of this revolution within within the western world so then we have yogananda who came in um, he represented india in the 1920s and he started the self-realization fellowship and this is still um, a pretty popular practice today almost um, like a sect of of religious practice that's in the late 1800s when it actually comes to the West and begins to practice we then get into the 19th century and here is where we get in the 1930s uh, Krishnamacharya and Shivananda Swami Shivananda so these are the two you know, fathers of modern yoga. Krishnamacharya is a little more popular in the West um, or a little more well known as the father of modern yoga. He was in Mysore and he was under the patronage of the king and so he learned a lot of things. There's another really cool image that I'd like to show you uh, that is specifically from this lineage it talks about the where the postures start to come from so krishnamacharya he teaches bks iyengar and that's iyengar yoga desikachar patabi joyce we have ashtanga yoga coming out of here very popular lineages coming to the west and spreading around and shivananda he was a vedanta practitioner so vedanta as in the vedas uh, the end of the Vedas, so kind of on the edge of the Upanishads. Uh, and he developed lots of ashrams around the world where people could come and practice in this yoga. Okay, and Vivekananda, as I said, World Religious Parliament, Shivananda. Krishnamacharya, who's got the most popular. Okay, I'm going to stop my share real quick. And then I'd like to go find another. Let's see. That image. Okay. There we go. All right. So we're looking at where some of these postures are actually coming from. This is quite an interesting aspect of yoga because it as I said it's the most domin dominant aspect within the western world and how most people are going to be exposed to yoga is through the asana practice. So here we have the 15th century so this is well into the current era. And we have our 84 traditional asanas, not only from the Atta Yoga Pradipika, but it, the Goraksha Samhita. Um, and these are the major postures from the oldest postures, basically the first ones mentioned that we found. And then as it comes into the 19th century and into the 1920s, we get... Um, Krishnamacharya becoming the modern father of modern yoga and what he's done is he's taken some other classical Indian exercises possibly some things from some ancient shamanism there's another lineage um, in there somewhere I forget the name of it then we have what came through the Hatha lineage 
And then we also have Scandinavian gymnastics. Uh, so this is really fascinating because the there was like the Russian ballet coming to India at the time because of the British colonialism. And so he worked also with the king. So he got to see these Russian gymnasts and put that into the postures that he was teaching. As well as this potential, I don't have any actual valid um, reference material for the fact that some of these postures came about because they were preparing Indian boys for revolution, for a British a re revolution against the British. Uh, this is just hearsay, and I've heard it a number of times. I think it's quite fascinating because you have all those warrior poses, even though yoga is so peaceful, right? <laughs> so it's a conglomeration of what we're getting now. Modern yoga is not so classical. There's a lot of variations and now even coming into the more modern age we have a lot of um, biomechanics that are applying to the postures themselves to make them more applicable to different body types and there's nothing necessarily wrong with these things just knowing that it's kind of coming from a conglomeration of the planet and its creativity um, not only isolated to the lineage of yoga of India. So then we have Indra Devi, the first Westerner to study with Krishnamacharya and bring yoga to the West as a practice. She started ashrams, also a Russian female. So then we have Patabi Joyce, we have Ashtanga and Vinyasa Yoga. This one's pretty popular. Iyengar Yoga, very alignment based. Deskachar, um, Ramaswamy, and Mohan. I'm not so familiar with these guys, but I'm sure you can find them if you look hard enough. Okay, and now let's go back to our timeline here. So just as a reference, we've got all the way from 6,000, maybe even 10,000 before current era. We're, we're talking about different aspects of mind, consciousness, working with meditation, all these things until, look how many years have gone by. We've got six, that's two, four, six, eight, ten. So ten to twelve to 1500 years maybe of all this yoga and meditation and philosophy. And then here we are before we see any physical postures come up. 1300, or actually this is more like a 12, 11, 1200 is when we see the first physical postures. And then 1500, they actually start to get in order. And then the modern yoga has evolved from only the 1800s. So less than 100 years with a lot of these practices. So even the evolution of Krishnamacharya's description of the postures has changed, or did change, from the 1930s when he said you should be able to adapt your body to, the, to this alignment. The 1960s he was saying the complete opposite, saying that the postures should adapt to the body. So very interesting that with less time of this practice on the planet we see more evolution uh, so the older it is the more time tested it can be so that's something that's really cool when we go back in time and we find things that still make sense today that's where the value is in yoga history so I hope that that is a great description I also like to just mention you know you're working with School Yoga Institute and the founder of School Yoga Institute studied with Patabi Joyce and also with Shivananda. So kind of mixed the Shivananda practices and the Ashtanga practices into what we now have as SYI Yoga, which is also now being um, evolved, we could say, 
with lots of different teachers from lots of different lineages. And so that's kind of what's happening to the modern yoga world. If you get a chance, look up the yoga poster. The yoga poster. And it's, uh, it's something like $35. And it shows all these lineages just like big out like a tree. All these different branches of yoga now. Different perspectives and, you know, different scandalous gurus there's just so much going on uh, so my passion and my encouragement is always to reach further back in time for time-tested results and practices all right thank you so much for joining me and i hope yoga history is a little more interesting Om. Oh.